This is the Sears Telegames Video Arcade, and if it looks just like something you're already familiar with, that's because it is. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 93 of Retro Bits. I was just one year old when Atari's video computer system was released in the autumn of 1977. I grew up in this exciting new world of home game consoles, and it's fair to say they left a big impression on me. With the new 2600 Plus being recently announced, I thought it would be a good time to take a look at the Sears version of what would become an icon. Now you can play most all the video games you'd ever want to play. Introducing the Sears Cartridge Telegame System. Over 150 video games, all on cartridges. This cartridge of 27 target games is included. But you can get more cartridges that have tank games, space war games, blackjack, speedway, over 150 video games so far. The Sears Cartridge Telegame System, sold only at Sears. A VCS in disguise, the Telegames Video Arcade was sold exclusively by Sears. Released in 1977, the same year as the Atari from which it was based, the console debuted at 180 US dollars. Sears already had an existing relationship with Atari, having previously rebadged their Pong consoles with Telegames branding. The idea was that the company would attach their trusted name brand to the product with the hopes that it would ease the fears of timid consumers over what at the time was a novel, costly, and unfamiliar device. Several Telegames models were released over the subsequent years as Atari revised the system, but the one we'll look at today is the very first. While there are over a dozen variants of the 2600, I've never owned any of them, until now. The VCS is there in some of my earliest memories, and I clearly remember playing Combat, Frogger, and Pitfall at friends' houses at a young age. It's a safe bet that the system was my first exposure to video gaming and set the stage for what was to come later. We won't spend a lot of time looking at the system manual, but I did find a few things interesting. On the cover page, the product is part of the Sports Center lineup, home of the Ted Williams brand. For some reason, the word cartridge is important enough to be the first word in the product name, but Telegames lacks the hyphen used elsewhere. I'm glad this is Sears Best, because at that price, it better be. The rest is pretty standard stuff, but I love item 4 in this list. I guess they weren't taking chances with a consumer base who had no prior experience with this type of device. And here it is, the Sears Telegames Video Arcade. And the first thing we can tell by looking at this is that it is filthy, filthy, filthy. The previous owner clearly stored it open to the elements in an attic or a garage where it could be exposed to dust and pollen. It is caked on there. And wherever I've set this thing down, wherever I move it, it leaves a pile of debris behind it. So we're going to clean this up right away. Now, the story behind this machine is that I purchased it during the second year of the pandemic, around March of 2021, for $60 from a local Craigslist seller. And that came complete with the system, RF modulator, power supply, a pile of games, controllers, and paddles. So I thought it was a pretty good deal, but it has been sitting for a long time and it was not tested. So I don't know if this works, but we will find out together. So what we have here is physically identical to the launch release Atari VCS or 2600 Heavy Sixer. So called because it has six switches on the front and it's physically heavier than the cost reduced versions that came later. There's also a slight difference in the bezel. What's different about the Sears version is first of all the branding. It says Telegames Video Arcade. Nowhere does it say Atari on it. And we have a silver front bezel here instead of the normal black and also the orange highlights that you would find on the Atari are different. The final difference here is that the pattern used on the simulated wood grain is different on the Sears version than it is on the Atari VCS Heavy Sixer. Here on the left side of the control panel we have the power switch, we have TV type for color or black and white, and we have the left player skill select from novice or expert. Over here on the right hand side, we have the skill select for the right player, the game select toggle, and the reset switch. On the back, there's not much to see except for the player one and player two controller inputs, as well as a 1/8 inch jack for the 9 volt DC power brick. 
And one final thing to note is that there is a hardwired RF connection coming out of the back of the machine. And as you can see, it is crazy, crazy long. I measured it and this is over 15 feet in length. So clearly the system was designed to sit far away from your television on your coffee table or near your couch and you would sit close to the machine. But that is clearly what they were intending when they made this cable so long. In terms of other notable features, there is a sticker on the back and it does say that it was manufactured for Sears Roebuck & Co by Atari Inc. in Sunnyvale, California. So this early model was made in the USA and it does have the model number and a serial number, but there's no date unless the serial number encodes the date here. Perhaps this means August of 1977, but it doesn't appear anywhere else on the machine. Now, I think it's time that we clean this thing inside and out. So, let me cue the music. Now that the plastics are all cleaned up, I wanted to show you some interesting things about this top cover. The first is the front switch panel is just clipped into place with these six different clips here. So it's clearly designed to be interchangeable for different branding and possibly a different switch configuration. Another interesting thing is if you can see it, there are two holes in the front panel that look like they were designed to house speakers. Though, as far as I can tell, no speakers were ever fitted internally to the Atari 2600. Taking a look at the bottom half of the case, it's really easy to see why they called this the Heavy Sixer. The plastic is half an inch thick all the way around and there's a real weightiness to this. You just don't see this kind of robust plastic casting in modern devices these days. And in addition to that, there's also this heavy RF shield which goes around the printed circuit board and together these account for most of the weight of the system. 
Now, I want to call your attention to these stickers on the back. I had masked over them with painter's tape to try and preserve them while I washed the case, but unfortunately, the paper stickers stuck to the tape and peeled right off. So I've destroyed the stickers on the back of the case. So I'm really bummed about that, but I wanted to point that out to you guys so that in case you were going to do something similar, that you would just be very careful to clean this with a damp rag perhaps and not try and cover up this with tape and then inundate it in water. That was a mistake on my part and I'm really bummed about that. While we've got everything apart, let's take a look at the main PCB for the system. It's attached to the I.O. portion with this ribbon cable and I don't think it comes apart so I'm not going to mess with it because I don't want to damage it. In terms of the main board though, it is very clean as you can see, having been protected inside of that RF cage. So that's very nice. And in terms of electrolytic capacitors, there are a few on the board, but I don't see any obvious signs of leakage. So I'm not going to arbitrarily replace them unless I see any problems that come up during testing of the system. On the back side of the board, there is this bodge wire that looks to be perhaps factory installed, but it looks like it connects the ground plane here to the ground plane here, so it must just be an additional ground wire. But one other thing I noticed is that the soldering on this board is really, really poor. It looks like it was done hastily, perhaps by hand. Let me get you zoomed in on that because I want you to see just what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's some really shoddy work there, but uh, if the system works, I'm not going to mess with it. If we have problems later, then I'll go back and look for cracked dry solder joints and things like that. But for now, let's move on. In terms of the main PCB, there's really not that much to it. We have these three custom ICs and that's about it. So this one here is the CPU. Over here we have the TIA or television interface adapter and last we have the Riot which is the RAM I.O. timer. So let's take a closer look at each of these. So first up is the CPU and the date code on there is the 24th week of 1977 so that would be six months into the year. That dovetails nicely with the August date that we think is on the serial number so probably a 1977 build. And the CPU here is based on the MOS 6502. This is the 6507 CPU. And the 6502, of course, is found in the Commodore and Apple 8-bits, uh, among others. But the difference here is that this one has fewer address pins and no hardware interrupts. So that made coding games a little bit more challenging due to the exact timing requirements, as well as the limited RAM, ROM, and I.O. that could be addressed, only 8 kilobytes in this case. Next up, we have the television interface adapter, which was developed by Jay Miner, who of course would go on to work on the Atari 8-bit home computers, as well as co-found what would become the Amiga Corporation. Now, the TIA generates the video output along with two sound channels and enables paddle input. Atari 2600 graphics consist of a background color, static play field, and five sprites, two players, missiles, and one ball object on the screen. There can be up to four colors per scan line out of a palette of 128 possible colors for this NTSC hardware. One interesting thing is that there's no frame buffer on this system, and that was a design decision in order to keep costs down because RAM was very expensive at the time this machine came out. So the CPU has to do all of the graphics construction in lockstep with the raster line, leaving very little computational time left to execute game code, which required very precise timing of instructions by the developers. Last but not least, we have the MOS 6532 RAM I.O. timer, or Riot, and this chip provides 128 bytes of static RAM for the system stack as well as game state. It also has a timer and provides I.O. for the front switches and the game controllers. The date on the chip is the 21st week of 1977, which further advances our theory that this is a very early release system. While researching for the video, I found an old tech tip from Atari. It states that certain revisions of the board require an 820 ohm resistor to be added between pin 6 and pin 9 of the TIA chip in order to improve color reproduction. I guess that's something we should check while we're in here. Now if we take a look at the resistance between pins 6 and 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, can see that we have 700 ohms, so it seems like there's already a resistor in place there. Let's see if we can't find it. 
start with pin six again, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll pin out. Okay, it looks like R213, let's see, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have resistor 213 between pin 6 and 9. We don't have to make this modification. I found another service bulletin that describes an issue with pre-revision 14 consoles that can be damaged by static electricity from the joystick button input. Atari's workaround is to add an additional capacitor and Zener diode at the joystick connector. What we need to do is check C236 and C237 by the joystick ports here and see if they've been modified already or not. What I can see here is it does look like a diode has been bodged in, which is what we are looking for. Let me take a look at the other side as well. So it looks like that service bulletin has already been performed by someone in the past and we don't have to do that one either. Awesome. Before we test out the system, I wanted to check out the original power brick that came with it. The first thing we notice right away is that they've given us an absurd amount of cable length, just like the RF lead. The other thing that's interesting about this is it uses a 1 8 inch style jack for the power, so you could easily plug this into a line-in or a headphone port and do some serious damage if you weren't careful. Now, the power brick itself is center positive, and it's rated for 9 volts at half an amp. Before we power up the Atari, I want to check the voltages coming out of the power brick itself. We should see 9 volts coming out of the thing. But if you look here, we've got 15.98, almost 16 volts coming out of our 9 volt brick. And the reason for that is because it's a cheap, unregulated power supply. The output voltage is affected by the load current. So the only way we're going to see what it's truly producing is if we apply a suitable load. So I've had a rummage around the garage and here's what I found. Some lamps from an old car that I no longer have. And this is for a turn signal or brake light. And you can see here it's rated for 14 volts and 4.9 watts. Now the power brick itself is nine volts and half an amp, so four and a half watts. So this should be a suitable load that we can use to test the power brick and see if under load it's producing nine volts or not. So let me get this hooked up. Okay, so here's the setup. I've got the light attached to the positive and negative leads of the power supply, and then I've tapped both of those and connected them to my multimeter as well. If I flip the switch, yep, the light comes on, it's nice and solid, and we're now seeing 10.87 volts DC coming out of the power brick, which is better than it was. It's still a little higher than I'd like to see, but the built-in voltage regulator on the Atari should have no problem handling this input voltage. It just might run a little bit hotter than we'd like. A cheap, unregulated power supply like this probably just consists of an AC transformer, a half or full bridge rectification circuit made out of diodes, and a smoothing capacitor. And we're going to see an output curve that kind of looks like a sawtooth, where the capacitor charges up and discharges and charges up and discharges. And if we fire up the power brick with the scope attached, we can see that sawtooth pattern right there. If we zoom in a little bit, it gets a little bit clearer. And let me get you zoomed in on the scope. The average, as we saw with the multimeter, is around 10.9 volts with the maximum at 11.6 and the minimum of 10.3. So again, a very cheap power supply that you would expect to find on something from this era. Now that we know the power supply is good, I want to test the onboard voltage regulator. Now this is a known problem with these machines. They do tend to run hot as evidenced by this large heat sink around it, but there are modern replacements available so we can replace it if we have to. So what I'm going to do is test the machine with no cartridge installed before we put it all back together. Let me just flip the switch here. And we'll test the input voltage. And that is again almost 11 volts with no cartridge installed. It will drop with a cartridge installed. And then the output voltage is 4.76 volts. So yeah, that should do. We should be okay to run this machine now. And if this thing fails in the future, we know that there are available parts to replace it with. 
in order to test things out, we're going to need some controllers. And these came with the system when I purchased it on Craigslist. These paddles are Sears branded, which is really cool. And they appear to be in excellent condition, nice and clean. So that's really cool. However, these joysticks are another story. They do not appear to be Sears or Atari branded. In fact, these look to be the joysticks from a Magnavox Odyssey 2, which as far as I understand, share the same nine pin connector, but are not Atari pin compatible. So I'm not sure how they ended up with the Sears Video Arcade in the same box. Now, I do have a pair of original Atari CX-10 joysticks that came with an Atari 800 that I bought a long time ago, but they are in really rough shape and they need to be rebuilt. So I'm gonna order the parts to do that and if we have time later on in the video, I might show that or I may save it for another day because I have plenty of other Atari compatible joysticks we can test with. In order to test the system, we're gonna need software and fortunately the Sears Video Arcade came with a pile of cartridges. One interesting thing is that early Atari games only used two kilobytes of ROM with a maximum of four kilobytes being addressable. Later games got around this by using bank switching to have more ROM on the cartridges. Another interesting thing here is that these games are Atari games that have been rebranded by Sears as official telegames and you can see the Sears logo down here. And there are a whole bunch of these telegames cartridges and each one contains the standard Atari games, Pong, hockey, soccer, volleyball. And they've got a number. That doesn't mean there's 50 games on here. It just means this is cartridge number 50. Now, Space Invaders was one of the first games to really put the system on the map. It was the first officially licensed arcade conversion for any home console. And it really did increase sales starting when it was released in 1980. Sales figures for the Atari 2600 doubled every year for three years in a row, aided by the Space Invaders release, as well as the release of the Pac-Man cartridge in 1982. All right, so here's the test setup. I've got the video arcade connected using the RF cable to the RF modulator plugged into this VCR that's tuned to channel three, and the VCR is connected to the Sony monitor using composite. So I'll just insert Space Invaders here, and we'll flip the power switch. Hey, look at that. It works. Looks horrible. Let's see if we can uh, start a game. Yeah, seems to work. It does not look good, but it does work. Awesome. Sound works too. Let's try another cartridge. Got Pac-Man here. Hmm. Okay. Just a little static on the screen. Let me try reseating the cartridge. Nope, that didn't do it. All right, let me try getting some contact cleaner. See if that helps. Still nothing. Interesting. Yeah, it is not doing anything. It looks like it's crashing. Well, let me try something else. Try combat here. Okay, that looks like it's working. Maybe the contacts are still a bit dirty. Oh, no, that looks good. Yeah, so is it common for cartridges just to not work? Maybe I need to take this thing apart and clean the contacts on the cartridge itself because it seems like other games work except for Pac-Man. Hmm, interesting. I mentioned earlier just how bad I thought it looked and yeah, check this out. I'm gonna start a new game and we're gonna zoom in on the screen. Just look how noisy that RF output is. The blacks are just fuzz and that gray border at the bottom is just flashing like you wouldn't believe. It looks really, really bad. There's so much interference on the screen.
Now, part of that issue could simply be because we have this absurdly long 15 foot RF cable that's picking up some interference out of the air. But another part of the issue could be this switch box that we've got to connect the RF cable to our VCR. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this right out of the way and we're just gonna disconnect the RF cable from the switch box. Instead, I'm gonna use this little RCA to coax adapter and I'm gonna put that right on the back of the VCR here. And to that, I'm going to plug in the RF cable from the video arcade straight into the VCR like that. And now, take a look at what we've got. Yeah, with that switch removed, it is much, much clearer. There is almost no snow in the background, and the pixels are much, much clearer now. However, a new problem has presented itself, and that's the machine is flaky. It just spontaneously goes nuts on me when it's in the middle of running. If I restart it, it seems okay. But I've noticed with various cartridges, like Pac-Man, some of them work and some of them don't, and the ones that do work tend to crash in the middle of operation. So let me look at that and we'll be right back. Okay, I think I found the source of the problem. I've clipped leads onto the output of the voltage regulator and I'm going to turn on the system with a cartridge inserted. Now we should be seeing five volts, but instead it's fluctuating between 3.6 and 3.8. So we're not getting good voltage regulation when the additional load of the cartridge is installed and no wonder the system is so flaky. So I think what we're gonna have to do is to replace the voltage regulator and go from there. So the voltage regulator is right here and it's clipped onto this heat sink with just a little clip with no screw. So it should come off pretty easily. And you can see from the soldering work here on the voltage regulator that it may have been replaced already. This looks like a rework to me. It's really a, a poor job. So I'm gonna get this removed and then we'll get this replaced. This thing is an original Atari piece, as you can see here, but it looks pretty charred. And also the thermal compound is completely dried up and, and just, it's probably not working very well anymore. So it's a good thing that we'll clean off this heat sink, apply some new thermal compound and put in a new voltage regulator. For that, I've ordered a kit from console5.com and the kit contains a new voltage regulator, thermal compound, a DC power jack, as well as a bunch of capacitors. Now, I'm not gonna just replace all the capacitors outright. I am going to test the ones on the board and see if any of them are bad, and I will only replace the ones that need to be. All right, the new voltage regulator is installed and I've tested out all of the capacitors to see if there are any problems. Got the double ding, so we're in pretty good shape here. I'm going to put another cartridge in, hook up the power, and then we'll see what kind of voltage regulation we have now. 
All right, I've got a cartridge installed. I've got the DC power connected. I've got the probes connected to the output of the voltage regulator. Let's flip the switch and see what we've got. Oh, would you look at that? A perfect five volts, 5.01 volts coming out of the system with the cartridge installed. All right, that's way better than what we were seeing before, even on the original Atari power brick. So I'm gonna get this thing hooked up to a monitor and let's make sure it's working properly now. So with the new voltage regulator installed, everything is working great. The machine is rock solid and stable. So let me get it all put back together and then we can take a look at a comparison of the before and after. I guess we should talk about video mods. First off, removing the RF switch box has already made a huge improvement. I honestly can't believe that it caused that much image degradation. While the device itself may have added some additional interference, I'm guessing that dirty switch contacts were largely to blame. In terms of video mods, we have all kinds of options. On the budget-friendly end, a basic composite board can be had for just around $10 on eBay. Don't expect too much from this, but it will save you the trouble of having to use an old TV or VCR to tune in on channel 3. The Cadillac of composite mods is the Ultimate Atari Video, or UAV board. This option also supports S-Video and will give you a much cleaner image, but the trade-off is a higher cost. With the required audio board, you're looking at around $70 plus shipping, which is more than I spent on the Atari in the first place. Finally, an RGB board is also available, but it's even more than the UAV. Regardless of which upgrade path you choose, you'll either need to drill holes in the Atari for the new ports, or run wires out the back to a breakout box. <laughs> You know what? I don't think I'm going to mess with it. I want to keep the video arcade original and don't want to put any holes in it. I already have this 2600 Mini with HDMI and the Mr. FPGA for RGB, so I think for just this once, I'll appreciate the machine for what it is and use it how it was originally intended to be used. The Telegames Video Arcade may just be another Atari 2600 out of more than a dozen variants and clones. Heck, 30 million of these things were sold in total, not even counting all of the modern remakes. Production ran for a whopping 15 years, all the way up to 1992. While it may be one of many, this Sears branded machine is a neat piece of history, and I couldn't be happier with how this restoration turned out.
So there we have it, the Sears Telegames Video Arcade. Did you have one? Or any version of the Atari VCS for that matter? This might be my first, but there's no denying that the 2600 was still an important part of my gaming history. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.